You're listening to the ASN Kidney News Podcast. John Jane, MD, is a distinguished neurosurgeon and residency training program director in neurosurgery. He is the past director of the American Board of Neurological Surgery and the current editor-in-chief of the Journal of Neurosurgery. Among his many honors is the Cushing Medal, the highest award given by the American Association of Neurological Surgeons. In this episode, ASN Executive Director Todd Ibrahim speaks with Dr. Jane about his perspective on residency training programs, the good, the bad, and the future. I'm just curious as to sort of the, the compare and the contrast between how your experience is different than, say, your current um, residents and some of the advantages you may have had, some of the advantages that they may have had or have. I, I don't think they had any advantages. I, I think I had all the advantages. I, I think being uh, being forced to to take these courses and, and not to have electives, it was the right thing. I think I, I was too young to decide what uh, was important, and I had extremely sophisticated professors who knew better than I. Again, it sounds very, I don't know, dogmatic, but I'm, I'm against the idea of electives when you're very young. You know, you're going to school so that to take advantage of, of people who are, who are sophisticated uh, uh, scholars. So uh, when I look at my residents, who, who are a very uh, superior group of, of young men, I don't think they had uh, as uh, as good a deal as I did. I think I had a really good deal, and I think they're being introduced to science so early and and concentrating on science so early was was not a good thing for their for the rest of their lives. You know, it it, it made them wonderful candidates for neurosurgery, good neurosurgeons, but it did not enrich their for their life. So, how would you change medical school? to address sort of the evolution of education and some of these issues? I don't think I'd ch- change medical school. I'd I change pre-medical okay. school. Uh, in one of Plato's uh, dialogues, the issues can, can virtue be taught. And I question whether later on virtue can be taught in terms of, for example, courses in uh, morality or ethics, uh, whether that really has any effect on people. I'm not sure. Perhaps it does, but I don't think the place to learn that is in is in medical school. I think people are are ethical and concerned about patients, or they're not. I think it's very hard to force people to do that. Do you find that on the scientific side, people are better prepared as they come into medical school, but not on the the sort of so what you're saying is the ethical, clinical judgment, that set of skills. That's that's where your concern is. Yeah. Definitely. They're extremely well prepared uh, scientifically. I'm, extre- I'm really impressed with the quality of, of uh, uh, the candidates. Mm-hmm. So as you consider candidates for your program, what are some of the, the attributes that you most value? Uh, I look at their US MLEs and uh, uh, they're going up mm-hmm. uh, in terms of the candidates. Uh, what's interesting and uh, is that uh, their in-service exams are going down, uh, in spite of the fact that they're they're better prepared coming in, and they do worse on the in-service exams than they did before. So is that is that something you're doing to them? It's let's put it this way: it is certainly a unintended consequence of eighty-hour work week. Mm-hmm. I think that their the eighty-hour work week has has uh, made people think that perhaps uh, dedication to what they're doing is not so important, mm-hmm. and that so-called balanced life is more important, so they do less well on the, on the in-service exam. Do you think you're going to have to extend the length of training to accommodate that issue? I hope not. We, we try and make it fairly intense uh, during that 80 hours, and it's, uh, it's still seven years. Uh, and so I, I think during those seven years, uh, in spite of the fact they're not as well-trained as they used to be, when they finish up, they, they are not as competent as they were before. There's now fellowships, and so if there's something missing, they, they can do fellowships. But I hope, I, I, I don't think it needs to be lengthened anymore except except in that postgraduate, uh, post-residency period, that, that sometimes that has to be done. So, so do you think, if I'm understanding you correctly, it sounds like on the medical school side, they're getting very good training and yeah. understanding sort of the science of medicine. 
the training period because of the constrictions of the 80 hour work week and some of the other rules, which we'll, we'll certainly circle back to, um, that there's just not enough time for them to, to develop the expertise they need, which is reflected in the in training exams. So they become more dependent on either additional training through a fellowship or I would guess through the maintenance of certification process or sort of continuing med- that puts more pressure on, on the continuing medical education part of it. No, I, I think it's the fellowship uh, that really uh, uh, finishes, it adds the final touch to, to their training. I think the uh, MOC is a, it w- is, is a very valuable thing. I never thought that neurosurgeons would submit to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and really, there was a, a, a enormous opposition among neurosurgeons to uh, maintenance of certification. But now it's done, and it's done very well. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with, uh, uh, with its value mm-hmm. and uh, the, the fact that it's uh, fair and uh, encourages people to continue their education. I, I, I'm impressed with it, but I don't think that it, uh, it, all it does is it maintains abilities that you've achieved by your, your training and perhaps a fellowship if necessary, but I think it's important. So looking at the 80-hour the work week, if hypothetically the limit of 80 hours was unchangeable, but you could change everything else within that, that construct, what are some of the things you would like to do differently as a residency program director? Within the 80 hours? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, I, within the 80 hours, there, there's some uh, fairly stringent rules that are, are very hard to abide by, uh, the requirement of a full day off, the, the 10-hour period after you're on, on duty. I think those are the things that it would be good if they were not there and that uh, I could live with 80 hours much more readily were those two things not there. So I think the, the requirements could be modified and made more consistent with, with the educational goals. Those are the two things. And those are the two things that interfere with, with the residents feeling like they own the patients and feeling like they, you know, ownership is something that everybody talks about. Everybody is worried that the 80-hour work week has uh, destroyed the sense of ownership. And one of the reasons is, is that they have to go home and they're scrubbing out a case where they've taken care of the patient the day before and all of a sudden they say oh sorry i gotta go it means i gotta go and uh, and my sleep is more important than than this patient who i've been i've been taking care of so i think it, the 80 hour work we could be modified to be more acceptable as we look at other countries they their training restrictions are more severe than the united states and and, and something i've never been able to reconcile is what it is that they do differently in the, the educational continuum that allows them to, to require less of their trainees. And I'm just wondering, as you've you know, given the fact that you have uh, considerable experience outside the U.S., what are some of your observations about how they handle that? We sent our, our residents to England uh, right from the very beginning. And so I saw that the transition of uh, restricted work hours, and it finally got to the point where Really, it was clear that the, the trainees there were not trained. They were, when they finished their training, they were very poorly trained, and I stopped sending my residents there. I, I did that under some uh, emotional protest because I had done it for so long, and my family had actually come from that part of England where I sent to my, my sent my residents, so I had a, an emotional attachment. It, the education just was, was so... Uh, obviously totally inferior that I stopped doing it. So, I mean, it's likely, though, that that given some of the, the external pressures on the ACGME and, and what a lot of state governments are doing, particularly in New York, looking at, at work hours, that it's likely that the hours will get more constrained. And I'm just wondering how you think the surgical community will react to that. Uh, I don't think you can train neurosurgeons, or I don't think you can train surgeons adequately in less than 80 hours, and I think there'll be a a tremendous amount of objections to to any further restrictions, Mm -hmm. and I wouldn't say I'm optimistic, but I'm hopeful that that's not going to happen. I know everybody considers it to be in the offing. Nurses have been particularly uh, adamant with the ACGME to prevent it from happening. You have a career as a surgeon, but also as an educator, and I asked you earlier about why you became a surgeon, and I guess I'm curious as to why you've dedicated your career to, to medical education as well. I think it's uh, partly in my nature, and I think it's partly 
uh, in my nurture, in terms of my nurture, uh, my training with, uh, with surgeons who were totally uninterested in medical education and were totally uninterested in the education of their residents. For example, during my eight and a half years of residency, I never had a attending neurosurgeon help me do a case, not once. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So it was really experimental neurosurgery. I learned to do it uh, by myself, morally uh, so questionable, uh, but that is the way training was. And then in my first position, I went to Western Reserve and sort of unbeknownst to myself, uh, I think I began acting that way. The residents were helping me and I did help them at the VA, but, but uh, it was more that, uh, that they were there to help me. And, and the, the chief there sort of saw that. His name was Frank Nelson. And he took me aside and he said, uh, i never forget this. He said, he said, John, he said, I, I think you've got the wrong idea. He said, he said, you're not here to make yourself famous. That's not why I hired you. You are here to train those who come after us. He said, don't you understand that? And it was like uh, Jean Valjean, you know, uh, it, it, it was, I, 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 truly, it was, it was a, a, immediately, it didn't take me five seconds to get the idea that he was absolutely correct and that, uh, that I had missed the point. I said, no, I said, I'm sorry. I said, Frank, I got it. I said, I'm sorry. I got it. It really changed me around. But I think it was, it changed me around to what, what uh, uh, was actually my nature. My nature was that I wanted to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. And he just gave me leave to, to be a teacher. During the years, what have you learned from your, from your students and the residents and the people that you've taught? Oh, a tremendous amount, naturally, but a tremendous amount. I think in, in the first instance, it's an open-mindedness about uh, different ways of doing things because as you're teaching, or at least the way I teach neurosurgery is, is in a sort of an open-minded way. I said, we don't, here's the way I do this. And you ought to know how uh, this is done because you ought to be able at the very least to do this and, and th this will work for you. Mm -hmm. And residents have said to me, uh, but what, how about if we do, what, let's make a little modification. Is that okay? I, and I say, yeah, yeah, I'd like to see that. So, and these are highly intelligent people, you know, they really, uh, they may be inexperienced, but they have thoughts about how to do things. And I say, yeah, yeah, okay. And so I have, uh, through the years, really modified the way I, uh, I do things on the basis of, of my interaction with the residents. And, and I remember at the beginning, I was criticized by older neurosurgeons. Uh, they said, well, you're not demanding that they do it the way you do things. I said, for sure, I'm not demanding that they do things the way I do things. I said, because I don't want to be doing things the way I'm doing things now, five years from now. So these people are allowing me uh, to grow. So it, it is a, a two-way street. It's not me just teaching them. It, it is us developing together. And, uh, uh, and that's been, been extremely important in uh, neurosurgery, which changes so rapidly. As you look at today's generation of medical students, as they select residency programs and careers, do you think they're choosing more with their their hearts or their, their brains? I am afraid the majority choose it with uh, with their brains. And I think, unfortunately, I think financial considerations are, are extremely important. It's easy for me to criticize that. And I, I, you know, that's the way human beings are. You, just to answer your question, frankly, I frankly think that uh, they look and they say, well, we can make more money if we do, well, for example, if, they, if we do spine surgery. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find that unfortunate. It's a fact of life. I think that's the way it is. Among my residents, I really try and, and this reason I don't tell them to do with anything. I just say, well, you know, you do what, what appeals to you. You should do what your heart tells you. I, you know, Sigmund Freud once said that if you're making a trivial decision, I like to say buying a car, you, you ought to weigh the values. You say, well, slam the doors, look at the motor, 
any decisions like that, you spend a lot of time with it. But when there's an important decision, like he said, like getting married or choosing a career, you don't do this. What you do is you, you do what your heart tells you to do. And that's what I tell my residents. That, that, no, don't, that I'm not sure what's going to be in the future. It doesn't matter. What do you want to do? Do you think there's something that, that national organizations like the American Society of Nephrology can do to help students or to help perhaps clerkship directors and, and mentors at the student level um, encourage their trainees to think more, you know, to, to make decisions more with their hearts? I mean, I just wonder how we can swing that pendulum. I've spoken a, in a critical way of, of courses in, in ethics and and, and I think courses in ethics don't work, but I think teachers who demonstrate ethical behavior can, can influence people. And you take a course in ethics, that means meaningless. But if you have a teacher who is obviously sympathetic to human beings and to human suffering, I think that, that can influence people. And it's a matter of, of, of mentors who, who emphasize the right things, and we know what the right things are. The right things for a doctor is to be concerned about poor suffering humanity. Right? I mean, we don't have to worry about that. That is, that is our, should be our principal concern. And I think a mentor who demonstrates that in his everyday actions can be influential, much more so than a say a, a, a pre medical school course in ethics or a medical school course in ethics that everybody they're tired and I sleep through it. Right, but, mm -hmm. but a mentor can make a difference, I, and that's but that's hard to achieve, and you know to 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 find mentors who are actually interested in, in, in doing that, uh, and and but they can do it in the course of, of teaching medicine. It, it it can be done. You know, when you're making rounds and you see a patient, you can teach the proper care, but you can also indicate an attitude towards the patient. And it, residents pick up on that, whether it will change somebody who, whose nature is not terribly sympathetic, I'm not sure. Uh, but I think somebody who's on the borderline, I think it can, can change it. How, how often does someone match into a surgery program and it turns out they, they don't have the, the physical ability to be a surgeon? Uh, not that often. In the program in, in Virginia, over the last 40 years, I have uh, uh, counseled one out of every five to drop out. Mm -hmm. It's an enormous dropout rate. Uh, but one out of every five people I have selected who are uh, really always wonderful candidates, I finally decide, and it's mutual. Mm -hmm. I've never fired anybody. But I sit down and talk to them. I say, now, are you really having a good time here? Are you really happy doing what you're doing? Or did you make a mistake? And we talk, and they say, you know, I just don't want to do this. Uh, and they'll go into neuroradiology or, or neuropathology. Or I had one guy, perfectly competent, very nice guy. He got a bad result. And he I came to my office, he started crying. And I said, you know, here's the thing. I feel bad about that thing as well. But this is neurosurgery. It's going to happen to you. Uh, every week. I don't think you can cry every week. And I'm just wondering if you could provide an example of, of, of an area where your program has been innovative. In 1969, when we started the program, it was innovative in that we uh, required two years in the lab. And that was, there was one other place in the United States that did that. It was actually in Syracuse. Uh, a guy named Bob King was doing it. He was doing it the first two years. And and I decided we were going to have two years devoted to the lab, and it was going to really be devoted so that they would be almost 100% of the time in the laboratory. And that was a, a real commitment because what it did was it took individuals off the service, uh, and it made the job of the, of the residents that were still taking care of patients much harder because we had two less people. It, so I think that was innovative, and it was accepted, and... It worked very well. Uh, I think the other thing was that the commitment to training the residents, namely that starting from year one, starting from day one, they were in the operating room and we let them do as much as they could. 
even if it was only an incision, I said, that's it, we stop. Now we continue on. So, uh, so progressive uh, responsibility uh, so that the patients didn't suffer and uh, uh, that they never got to do anything uh, except under supervision and uh, in a safe way. Uh, uh, and I think that was innovative and, and we've kept those two things. We've kept a commitment to research and we've kept a commitment to progressive learning. Uh, I think that's important. I think in every field, progressive responsibility uh, so that when you reach the end, you're, you're where you want to be. How could that work within the framework of the ACGME? In other words, as we look at the rules governing residency and fellowship training, even student education, if we move from a calendar approach and sort of a mile, to more of a milestone progressive learning approach, is, have you thought about ways that that would work? Yeah. You know, for neurosurgeons, this is a, a very important. It's, it's defined you should be able to do a ventriculostomy in year one. Uh, you should be able to do a z -z 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 and so mm -hmm. on. It doesn't work. And it doesn't work because individuals learn at completely different rates. You know, I have had uh, surgeons who uh, start out uh, like this and become extremely good very, very quickly, and then very often only go that much more mm -hmm. to the end. And I've had others who go like this, and 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 I'm worried. I'm saying, hey, come on. You know, I'm thinking myself, you're not really moving at the rate. And then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. they come up, and then. The majority go like this, right? But uh, but for for the outliers, this one and this one, that kind of formula doesn't work. Uh, so uh, it, it's one of the, the the things I think the ACGME should loosen up on, on some of those requirements. I, I think they're much too rigid in terms of what they require. For example, one of the things I'm going to have to defend uh, right now because I'm already under criticism is the fact that I. Uh, don't finish one out of five uh, residents. They are something they've written about. They said you you should uh, improve your selection criteria. I, you know, I've been trying to improve my selection criteria for 40 years, and I've been unsuccessful. I, I really cannot 100% of the time, in fact, it's only 80% of the time, can I predict who is going to finish. And I picked nothing but the best and, and it's uh, but it turns out that when they see neurosurgery they don't want to do it in programs where it, it, where they're not pressured as much as we pressure our, our residents we really pressure them uh, they can get by and they finish and they don't even know that the fact they didn't really want to be neurosurgeons and they practice for 10 years and they're okay and then they say oh god you know I'm kind of bored with this I'm going to you know drop out so uh, I don't. I don't want that to happen, and uh, I think that you can't be a hundred percent sure on the uh, uh, inlet, but you can be sure on the outlet that you don't graduate somebody who isn't meant to be a neurosurgeon. But I'm, that, that, that's that's going to be a real bone of contention. Mm -hmm. I know. So, so what happens if if they don't agree with you? What do you What do you think that the, the what, what are going to do? Yeah, I, I think they're probably going to. Uh, uh, continue to be critical, but not really come down on me too mm -hmm. hard. Our record is too good with, mm -hmm. with all with the greatest possible modesty. It, 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 it's not bad in terms of, of the training of neurosurgeons. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be clear. Well, and it sounds like you've had core principles that have guided the program from when you started it and that, that those haven't changed, but the, the fellows have changed. Um, the, the way that fellows are prepared coming in has changed and how the program has changed. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question is, 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 do you feel like the program's better now or do you think it was better in the early 70s? Or Except for 80 hours a week, mm -hmm. it, it, uh, it's better now. Uh, it would be unequivocally better if were it not for that. For the 80 hours, and it's not just the 80 hours; it's it's the 10-hour restriction right. and, uh, uh, going home. Uh, but I think I think we do a better job. And as you talk to your colleagues, either nationally, but particularly within the institution, do you feel like they that they feel the same way in, in other departments and other residency programs? No, I don't. I don't. It sounds immodest for me to say it. No, I I don't think that. I'm embarrassed to, to 
but, but no, I think we have a particular uh, emphasis on our residents. I think our residents are the most important thing to us. Mm -hmm. uh, our decisions in the department are based upon what's good for the residents, not what's not not what's good for us. Honest to God, mm -hmm. I mean, that is how we we do it. And and I don't think other surgical specialties or medical I don't know about medical specialties and I don't truly know that much about all the uh, other surgical specialties but I know something about them and I don't see that I mean I don't want to put words in your mouth but it sounds like a sort of core belief of yours is that that the mission drives everything and that that if if your mission is training the next generation then the decisions of the department the institution should be based on on that mission and, and on the training, the education of the next generation, is that fair to say? Yeah. Do you see, do you think, I mean, how has academic medicine changed during your career related to that, that sort of core belief? Again, my view of academic medicine is, is so, it's rather narrow, you know, you know it's, it's neurosurgery that I, I know something about. Uh, I know a little something about the ACGME, not much, but just because they reviewed me. I think probably all of medicine, this is just my impression, that all of medicine is more oriented towards uh, trainees than they used to be. I, I, I think there, there is a shift from uh, using trainees just as, as to help the attendants. Mm -hmm. I, I think that has changed. I, I think there's much more emphasis throughout medicine on, uh, on the training of, of, of residents. That's my, that's my impression. But still, I think there there still is a a lot of of self promotion that goes on uh, that the residents are there and that's wonderful. They can write papers, they can take care of my patients, and I will throw new bones here and there. Uh, but that <laughs> that's what they're there for. But I think it's improved over the last forty years from from utter indifference mm -hmm. to the residents to to much more concern. If you could do one thing to improve it more, what would it be? To improve education? The, the education for, for residents. Well, you know, quite honestly, I think the, the, the biggest problem is, is the 80-hour work week. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that's the thing that most concerns me right now. And, the, and uh, the, my constant effort to make the residents feel like that they own the patients, that, that, that these are human beings that they're responsible for. And you know, we're, we're constantly on that thing and uh, so we're, we're so aware of it but I think that is the major obstacle to improving uh, uh, education in, in medicine is, is the work hours. Well Dr. Jane thank you again for visiting us today. Thank you so much for asking me. This podcast is copyrighted by the American Society of Nephrology. All rights reserved. All content in this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be medical advice. The information in this podcast should not be used during a medical emergency or for the diagnosis or treatment of any medical condition. Please consult your doctor or other qualified health care provider if you have any questions about any medical condition or before taking any drug, changing your diet, or commencing or discontinuing any course of treatment. Thank you for listening to this podcast of the American Society of Nephrology. Nephrology.